We continue our series on life after Nick Saban, and uh, we got to check in on the Auburn Tigers. Justin Hokinson, Auburn Live on Three's Auburn site. Justin, what what is the attitude on the Plains these days now that uh, that Nick Saban is not in charge of Alabama anymore? Oh man, uh, probably uh, probably a sense of relief. Probably long time coming. Probably a little bit of Auburn fans thinking uh, I wasn't sure if this day would ever come. You know, probably probably a mixture of that. Um, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's it's been man, it's been 17 years of of just dominance really from from him and that Bama program, and so I think for a while Auburn fans are just wondering when when it would uh when it would end. I mean, they now Auburn to their credit has has found ways to be competitive and and. Um, had the 2010 season and the 13 season and the 17 season where they uh, made it to Atlanta and won it, won the championship a couple of times and have beaten Nick Saban. So they, they found a way to break through a few times, but uh, it was tough. I mean, even yeah. the times they beat Alabama, it was, it was close games and it kind of took everything they had to do it. So probably a little bit of all that and now trying to figure out, okay, is there this window now that we as an, we as a program Auburn, do, is there, is there now a window now where we can, um, you know, our doors sort of cracked open that we can step into. Well, and, and that's the thing with Auburn. Like, what has happened at Auburn since, if we, if, well, let's just say since Nick Saban's been at Alabama, from, from 07 to 23, I, I think most fans, most fan bases would take what Auburn has accomplished, a national title, two SEC titles, three SEC West title. Like, they, they take that. And, and I know it's been up and down the, the way it's gone. But I think most would take it. But I think because with Auburn, like it was their rival that was this good, like it's it's suddenly made that not good enough. Yeah, I would agree. You're you're comparing yourself every day to the greatest run in the history of college football, which is what Nick Saban just accomplished at Alabama. So every year and year after year, you're comparing yourself to to that. So nothing would match up. You know, um, like you said, you, you, I mean, Auburn since 2010, I mean, they've been to the national championship game twice and they've been to the championship game in their conference three times. And so there's a, there's a ton of teams that would, that would take that. Absolutely. But when you're comparing it to your rival and the team uh, in, 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 in the state across the state, nothing is going to match up to that. And so you're just sort of, you're sort of measured against that. And it's an interesting dynamic because, you know, I think Auburn fans look at the program as w they expect championships. I mean, Auburn fans, they do. I mean, sometimes it's not even realistic given the, the state of the program at different times, but that's what they expect. They want to win the SEC and they want to win national championships, period. Um, and so it's it's been interesting trying to say, well, is that how is that a realistic expectation when Nick Saban's doing what he's doing at Alabama in the division, in the conference right there? And to Auburn fans' credit, I think for the most part they're like, "No, nah, we're we're not going to change. We think that's what we should do." And it's probably caused some some issues at times, um, just in terms of expectations and, and from coaches or fans or whatever. But um, that's the expectation, and it always has been. Even with Nick Saban there, even when it's been, you're looking at it going, "Well, that's a real a real tall mountain to climb." Well, and, and now it's year two of Hugh Freeze. It feels like, given the changes he's making, that he's kind of going back to what he's comfortable with. I, I you know, it seemed like he, he kept some folks that were on the previous staff that uh, he wanted to keep some Auburn guys around. That maybe didn't work out as well. Also, he's going back to calling plays, which it's weird because that you have the these coaches now who say, "Well, there's too much other stuff to deal with. I, I can't do." It. But Hugh Freeze has always been better when he's called the plays, so. What do you think went into that decision and, and how much do you think it changes things going forward? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting dynamic. I mean, I think he's definitely more comfortable calling plays and he feels like he's good at that. He he made the comment this year at one point that, you know, he said he said at one point I, I would like to think of myself as as one of the better play callers in college football. But to his credit, it was it was a moment of honesty. He kind of was like, but I don't know that that's necessarily now, but at one point I thought I was that person. Um, and so he, he, he thinks a lot of his ability to, to call plays. And so I think the way the offense sort of unfolded this year made him go, I can't, I don't know that I can be on the outside looking into this thing. Cause he, he wanted to be involved. 
but there were some terminology issues that sort of caused some hesitancy where Philip Montgomery had inserted his entire offense and terminology. And there were times where he was hesitant to get involved because he didn't completely know all of that mm -hmm. terminology. And so he's like, well, if I step in here, I could make things more confusing. Uh, but you could you could see it on his face. He was he was struggling with, do I get involved? How much do I get involved? Do I let Philip Montgomery do the job? Am I going to make it worse if I get involved? Um, and the other aspect is the recruiting thing. The thing he pointed to a lot was I needed to take a step back and recruit and align our NIL and boosters and get a lay of the land. And I needed to make sure that this first recruiting class was on point. Um, and if and, and, and that was just a bigger deal to him. I think he made that a priority over calling plays. He thought one or the other, I could call plays, but I have to get recruiting right. And, and he was a major part of this recruiting class. He was calling prospects and texting. He was he was on the phone with, with, with a lot of these guys as much as any of the other assistant coaches. He made it a massive priority. I think the question I have is going back to calling plays, I think is smart for you. Like I, I have no issue with that. But does he feel good enough about the, the the state of the recruiting apparatus? Because if he thought it was so important that he stayed out of play calling to do that in year one, in one year, is it where he's comfortable at to now he's like, okay, I can go back and call plays. I think we've, I think everybody's aligned. I think we've done enough. I feel good about the new staff. Derek Nix is a phenomenal recruiter. Yeah. Carl is a phenomenal recruiter. Wesley McGriff is. The staff that, that he brought some of his guys from Liberty have done a really good job. Marcus Davis has shown himself to be a, a good recruiter. So maybe he feels it's in a decent spot. The boosters and everybody are aligned NIL wise. And he feels like, okay, I've got to lay the land. I've got this thing a little bit organized where I think I can call plays. And we can do it because now he's like, now we got to win. Year two, there's no, there's no, um, there's no excuses or passes. You know what I mean? Like year one, yeah. you can get away with anything. Year two, you you lose to New Mexico State, and it's not okay. Year one, right? Not great, but we'll overlook it. You do that in year two, and it's uh, you know, he's getting calls going. What's the deal? What's the problem there, Hugh? Exactly, exactly. And you know, it, it's interesting the the recruiting piece of it because so much has changed. And I wrote about this with with Saban leaving Alabama, like. Alabama doesn't recruit itself anymore. It, Kalen DeBoer is going to have to just jump in and recruit the way that Nick Saban did if they would like to have the same kind of rosters. But now you've got NIL and everything else. And uh, I, I do think it's it's interesting because you talked about, you know, the winning piece of it. Hugh Freeze probably has to do what he has to do to win for recruiting as well. Because if you don't win this year, it does, nobody's going to want to come right. because then you start the next season on the hot seat. But if you win this year, people see, oh, this is a this is a place on the upswing. It's a place transfers would want to come. I mean, and look, they're they're getting transfers already. They had Antonio Kite from mm -hmm. uh, from Alabama just just now, and I don't know if you look at the recruiting class, it, like the Cam Coleman flip, I thought was it was a pretty telling one. Here you have this guy who's who's right down the road in Phoenix City. He's going to Texas A and M. And then you you get there and you go get him like that feels like a pretty big one. And Auburn hasn't had a dynamic receiver in so long. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to remember. They've had, they've had some some OK receivers at times. But think back to to receivers that they have signed out of high school that are, you know, in the discussion of best in the country or even in the discussion of best one in the southeast. It is rare if if not hasn't happened in the last 20 or so years. I think Cam Coleman and Perry Thompson were monster uh, additions for multiple reasons. One, one was a flip from Alabama, from Mobile. Mm -hmm. I mean, just for people that understand recruiting in the state of Alabama, if you don't, Mobile, going into Mobile, if you're Auburn and getting a five-star is 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 so unbelievably hard since Nick Saban arrived. Alabama yeah, you, you, pretty you much could only do that, that when Mike Shula was there. Like yeah. that was not something that happened once Nick Saban showed up. It's so hard. They got a few. Trey Williams was a linebacker down there that they got. Mm -hmm. They got a few, but it was very, very tough to flip an Alabama commitment for Mobile. Unbelievable. And then Cam Coleman uh, is from Central Phoenix City, which is right down the road from Auburn. And you might think, well, how are you not? Central Phoenix City has turned into a powerhouse and has produced a ton of talent over the last five years. Auburn's got nothing from Ju them. Justin Ross was was Justin that Ross school, right? the Clemson. Yep. Um, nothing. So you you didn't just get two monster receivers. You flip one from Bama. You flip one from A and M. But you get them from two locations that have produced talent lately. That they, they have not gotten from. Uh, and then of course you toss in somebody like Joe Phillips, who almost went to Georgia. Toss in Demarcus Riddick, 
who was a flip mm. from Georgia. And there's a there's a few there's a a handful of full of guys that he got signed that you're like that that, that are just telltale signs flip from Bama, flip from Georgia locations that have been tough to recruit to that show you he's up to the he's up to the challenge. I think the interesting thing with Saban in the window is the first thing I look at is in-state recruiting. I mm-hmm. think the NLL, the NIL landscape, I think has changed things a little bit. Like DeBoer should, when you've got NIL, you should be able to, uh, you know, alleviate some concerns about Southeastern recruiting, let's say, because you've got NIL. Yes. Like that should make up some ground there. But I think in-state recruiting, there's there's good talent in Alabama every year. That's the first place where Auburn and Hugh Freeze can take advantage of Nick Saban being gone, a new staff going in. They've worked really hard last year to build relationships. They already made inroads this year. That's the the most immediate thing I see them going. Hey, in state now, if you're Auburn and Hugh Freeze, they are they are going to be right there with Alabama on 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 anybody they want to go after. I'm not saying they're going to dominate the state or whatever, but here for about the next year while while that new staff at Alabama is getting their feet uh, underneath them, Auburn's got a great chance to to continue a bunch of positive momentum with in state recruiting. Well, and and the thing is. Recruiting the state and the region, you look at who they brought in, Charles Kelly, Derek Nix, guys that have been recruiting in that area basically forever. Um, the the candidates that have been thrown out there for defensive coordinator, if if it's Chris Kiffin, who's with the, the Texans right now, uh, if he were to come back to college football, DJ Durkin's been in the SEC for a long time. Uh, it feels like they are they are trying to load up on those guys who understand how to do that no doubt, and understand what Freeze wants. That's probably his biggest concern right now. And it's a concern. The thing he's focused on is, okay, year two, I need my staff to be completely aligned with what I want X's and O's and with what I want internally and culture-wise. I need to make sure that my staff, top to bottom, will promote my culture and, and we will have zero issues. Um, I think that's, that's you know, Cornell Williams out, Zach Etheridge out, good coaches, Auburn guys, but now that they're gone, the, the focus has got to be, okay, replacing them and filling OC and DC, it's I need to make sure top to bottom that I can build the kind of community. That's a huge thing of what Hugh Freeze wants. He's talked about it over and over again about building a community because in this day and age, you got to get these guys to stay. you, you got to mm-hmm. build something beyond just playing time that will keep these guys on campus and not wanting to enter the portal every chance they get. And Hugh Freeze sees the importance of building that culture and community um, in addition to, hey, building a, building a program that produces NFL talent. So Derek Nix is a guy like that. Chris Kiffin could be a guy like that. Wesley McGriff, is, is, he's super tight with. Bringing him back, making sure he didn't go to, to Texas A&M. Those are all hires that he, I think he's going to look at the staff and go, okay, I feel really comfortable with everybody there that's going to promote my culture 100%, no concerns for me. I don't think there's going to be any – lost in translation between me and my players. And that's a massive deal, I think, going into year two. Well, and I've talked to coaches about this. Like like you said, they have the players have to like being there. If they don't, they're just going to leave. They're, they're going to go you know, see what they can get in the portal. And even in the NIL era, if the money's similar, and I would imagine at Auburn and kind of its peer SEC institutions, like the money's going to be pretty similar. So then you just pick where do you want to be. And... That's you're right because I do wonder, like with with Philip Montgomery, with Ron Roberts last year, those were guys that had not really worked with Hugh Freeze before. How much was it just not these guys didn't really know each other? Yeah, I think I think with Roberts, it it, it turned into a big deal. I think Ron Roberts did a good job with the defense, honestly, with 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 the pieces and what was there. Defensively, Auburn was pretty good, but but personality wise. It, it it turned into a, a something that just wasn't working. And I think more stuff came out after the season in terms of exit interviews where the more you got feedback, it was like, okay, this isn't working. This, this is, I got to make yeah. a move here. Philip Montgomery, I think was a situation where, I mean, I, I don't think their relationship was bad. I think that was just a, a tricky deal where he is trying to get involved and you're trying to figure out quarterbacks. And I mean, at one point in the season, look in that Ole Miss game, you had Philip Montgomery calling plays for one quarterback, and you had Hugh Freeze calling plays for another quarterback when they were <laughs> rotating Robbie and Peyton. You had wow. not just two guys calling plays. You had two guys calling plays depending on the quarterback. Like, okay, I got plays for Robbie. You got plays for Peyton. And, and that is just not a way to piece it together. They were just – they were 
they kind of got themselves in a situation and we're trying to figure it out. So their relationship, I think, was fine. I think that's just a deal where he's like, okay, I, I need to take back play calling. And so that that obviously means that I've got to make a change there. The Roberts thing, I think, was more of a personality issue and they didn't mesh. And recruiting wise, I, not, not, I didn't hear anything great in terms of their abilities to recruit, not, not negative necessarily, but I didn't hear any rave reviews about their ability to recruit. You're replacing Philip Montgomery with Derek Nix. Phenomenal from the state of Alabama. And then potentially if you were to do DJ Durkin or Chris Kiffin for Ron Roberts, you're, it's a massive upgrade there as a, as a recruiter as well. So let's talk about the quarterback situation because it felt like going into the bowl game that there was a vote of confidence given to Peyton Thorne. And then it felt like coming out of the bowl game, it was no, okay, we, we got to figure this out. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, we talked to Hugh Freeze going starting bowl practice, and he was asked about the portal situation at quarterback, and he absolutely um, said, "Look, Peyton Thorne's got a ton of ability. He's got a ton of potential." He pointed to to some games. I mean, and look, some of the stats back that up. I I don't have them all in front of me, but there's some advanced stats when you dig into the last four or five games of the season where Peyton was pretty good, given the limited number of passes he threw. Then of course you have New Mexico State that went poorly. That was not all Peyton Thorne's fault. That was a that was just a top to bottom failure. And then the bowl game was pretty rough for everybody as well. But yeah, he gave a support of Peyton Thorne. He gave a support of, of of Holden Gurner and his potential. And 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 in conjunction with that, he was also like the portal. We evaluate these portal quarterbacks. But I told our board from the beginning of the portal season opening. Look, I think that they're going to look at quarterbacks, but I do not think he feels like he's desperate for one. If the yeah. right one comes along and it's a good situation and he feels like the fit's there and they're not asking for too much in I.O. money, I think that he'll look at it. But I do not think he is so desperate to take anybody, and that's kind of how it's played out. The bowl game changed things. The bowl game was so bad uh, for a lot of reasons, and Peyton wasn't great. And and I did talk to some people afterwards that I think I think Hugh sort of after that game was like, Maybe, maybe I misevaluated this. Maybe I do need to bring a portal quarterback in. Now, I still don't think he's desperate to to get one. I still think Hugh Freeze battles the the whole NIL era. Like he's an old school guy. He'll play the game, but I still think there's a part of him that's like, if you're asking for too much, or if I feel like you're gonna come in and feel entitled to the job, I don't want to play that game. So I do think he battles that some, but I do think he's closer to wanting to get a portal quarterback in there now than probably when bowl practice started. It's just, does he do it now or after the spring? I, I, I just, I don't see how you can wait till after the spring and you miss a whole spring camp. You, you miss messing, meshing, meshing with Derek Nix. Um, but I don't know what the options are now, but I do think he wants to bring somebody in, but it's gotta be a, a right fit. I think in his eyes. Yeah. And that's the thing. There's just not that many guys in there. And the only portals that are open at the moment are places where the coaches just left. So yeah. it, it's, a, it's a little bit trickier situation. But it, it is going to be interesting because it, it, it may come down the spring. I mean, that's when they got Peyton Thorne last year was after spring as well. It, it was. But, you know, one of the things that not only Peyton talked about, but even Hugh talked about was, well, wait, you know, he didn't go through spring. Like that was an excuse yeah. kind of from Hugh and, and from Peyton. And it's a legitimate one. It's not, it's not like that's a bad – it's a legitimate excuse. But um, it was, you know, they didn't go through spring. They arrived in the summer. And, you know, Peyton's trying to pick up a, a new offense within a matter of weeks and then fall camp starts. That's a tough situation. I think people forget that about Peyton is, you know, give him another winter and spring and summer and then fall camp. And, and maybe he's at a completely different place in terms of his understanding of the offense and development. Um, but I do think you've got to get somebody in there. It's pretty risky to try to bring somebody in after spring, especially when you have a new OC involved and, and, and all that. That's if you if you feel like you need an upgrade, if you feel like I need competition there, I need to push that room. And if Peyton wins the job, fine, but I need to push that room. Then you, I would think you got to get somebody in there now, and it's got to go. It's got to happen during spring ball, and not wait till the summer. Yeah, it's it's going to be a fascinating situation over the next few weeks because if you're going to take somebody in the portal now, that it's got to happen pretty soon. Yep. And uh, but but I will say this, Justin, thinking back to two years ago. It was two years ago next week that all of the stuff started bubbling up with Brian Harson, and after year one, and it does feel like a very different situation after year one of Hugh Freeze than after year one of Brian Harson. even though the records might not have been that different, even though they had the same kind of narrow loss against Alabama. Like, it feels like a completely different time now. 
It does. It's similar. Look, records were identical. Both had close losses at home to Alabama. You know, Harson even beat Ole Miss that year. Ole Miss yeah. was 10th in the country, and, and they beat Ole Miss that year. Now, you had Bo Nix. It's a big difference. You had Bo, and who was still really good, um, and you had Tank Bigsby, of course. The difference really is recruiting. You know, there was some signs on the field. You're like, okay, maybe, you know, there were some decent things that happened that first year at Harson, but recruiting-wise, night and day. Night and day in, in terms of the – I think that first class for Harson probably finished 16th, 17th, but in the SEC, that is – that's down the line. But there was some things that started to that started to surface in terms of the effort that Harson was putting towards recruiting. Um, he he just didn't he didn't view it with the importance that it needed to be viewed at. He thought you could go in with X's and O's, and then I'll go find the right fit, kind of like he did at Boise. I'll go find the guy that kind of fits the program, but we're going to coach him up and scheme him up. And uh, yeah, you got to coach well, but in but if you're going to win a national championship, or you certainly are going to compete in the SEC, you better have talent first and foremost. And Hugh Freeze completely understands that. That's the biggest difference between the two. If you're trying to figure out year one and year one is the effort and the intensity towards recruiting and also overall fit. Hugh's a, Hugh gets the SEC. He gets Auburn. He gets the boosters. He understands all that. Parson did it. And he rubbed the boosters wrong immediately. It was just a bad fit. Even if even if Brian Harson wanted to go out there and kill it in recruiting, there were still some other hurdles that could have been an issue so fit wise and recruiting wise it's it was night and day between those two and that is why you were covering a defensive coordinator search and not covering a are they going to fire the head coach in yeah. in february of his you know right after his first year yeah. so uh justin appreciate it and uh enjoy this uh this time going to be a hopeful off season at auburn i imagine with uh with nick gone yeah, yeah, it's gonna be our, our fans are are uh I will say our message board is having some yeah, they're having some fun. For for once they're, they're <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to a buddy that's that's a big Alabama fan that's a that's a member of the BOL uh our mm-hmm. on three Bama side, and he's like, Look, for years I just I didn't check the board. I mean, we we would land the number one class, we'd win 12 games, it was cruise control. I didn't and now he he can't stop. It's just a different animal. Like they're that's now right. with refresh, everybody else. Refresh. They're, Refresh. Yeah, they're refreshing. They're now with everybody else. And our fans are like sort of relishing it a little bit. Auburn's got to figure out their stuff, their program, and they gotta yep. solidify their program to take advantage of, of the opportunity. But but yeah, you're starting to see a little bit of that going, yeah, welcome to everybody else has got issues, you know. So ain't ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. But yeah. <laughs> Justin, thank you so much. All right, see ya.